So I think it's pretty safe to assume that anyone watching this video has probably already heard of Street Fighter 2. It was the fighting game that really put the genre on the map and set the standard in many ways, almost as a template for other games to follow. Now we're very familiar with all these rules and mechanics with how fight games work now, but back then it wasn't so clear. And what we're going to do today is take a look at a bunch of fighting games that came out before Street Fighter 2. And it's not going to be a comprehensive list. There's really a massive amount of fighting games out there. We're going to primarily look at arcade games and track mechanics that relate back to Street Fighter 2. We'll also include snippets from console games to kind of set the context so you get an idea of what kind of games were coming out in the time. So let's get started. Starting with Sega's Heavyweight Champ from 1976, which is considered the very first fighting game. And this is a discrete logic arcade game that uses a unique handle type of control for each player. It utilized a simple black and white monitor, and the players could control either high or low punches until either opponent would fall down to the mat. The game is actually lost to time due to the nature of the discrete logic circuit. But there does exist some footage which has recently been shared on YouTube, and I'll share a link to that below. Now, Sega actually remade this game in 1987 under the same name. However, this time it's a Punch-Out clone, which was another popular boxing game before this. Boxing video games are inextricably linked with fighting games in the history. So while we won't be covering every boxing game, we can see by looking at some of the early boxing games how they were trying to establish the best viewpoint and ways to control the boxing itself. Through early boxing games like Sega's Champion Boxing and SNK's Main Event, we can see some different approaches happening in the best way to figure out how to present it, how to actually make the interactions happen, and how to measure things like the life bar and to know when a player should be going down, how to get up, all those kinds of details. Next, from 1979, we have Warrior by Vector Beam Software. And this is a single color vector based game which uses overlays to give the player the idea of the background. And it's a one on one sword fighting game, which is supposedly the first game to utilize motion capture. Each player is given a single button joystick to control the action where they navigate around the arena trying to avoid the pitfalls in the middle while confronting the other player trying to strike them with the sword. The top-down viewpoint and unique controls are a far cry from what we see in gaming today. The early 80s were still a very experimental time for fighting games, as seen in Taito's Ring Fighter from 1984, where we're given a large play area and small boxers which is a very large contrast to another game that came out that same year, which is Nintendo's Punch-Out. Now this game really set the world ablaze as far as boxing video games in terms of realism and complex mechanics that resembled elements of a rhythm game, some elements kind of like a puzzle game, but overall it was a fairly accurate interpretation of how to figure out the control scheme, punching left and right with your different buttons, and dodging, so including all that along with the health bar at the top. It's a truly landmark game, and as we all know, it got ported to the NES as Mike Tyson's Punch-Out in 1987. There's also another well-known fighting game from 1984. It's Karate Champ by Data East, but this one also had the most complex and difficult controls that you could think of at the time. Each player is given twin arcade sticks which they can use to articulate a number of different moves. However, trying to remember which combination of directions causes which actions is very confusing and not intuitive to the player at all. The visual appeal of the game really stands out for the time and definitely seems like a precursor to the presentation that we saw in Street Fighter 2. Now this is one of those games that I felt like was seen everywhere at arcades at the time, but it was never really popular. and. Most people that played it were there for trying to figure out how to do the moves and then they would give up kind of quickly. 
Now, another game from this same time period is Jordan Mechner's Karateka. And this is a game very similar with a karate style martial arts fighting. And it has fluid animation, making it stand out for the time. And this one was released on a number of different platforms. This is the Famicom version seen here. It's worth noting that the controls implemented here in Karateka made a lot more sense for the player compared to Karate Champ. While we're talking about the Famicom, I should also mention Urban Champion, another game from this year, and another title from Nintendo. Quite a big difference between the Arcade Punch-Out and Urban Champion, and this showed that there was still a big difference between what was capable on the NES versus what was in the arcade. And while this game is pretty interesting from a fighting game perspective, it's really rather simple and there's not much depth to it. It feels like more of a mini game. Nineteen eighty five saw the fighting game trend continue, and none was more innovative and influential than Konami's Yi R Kung Fu. And this was impressive because it gave us many of the standard mechanics that we are familiar with today. Jumping was done by moving the joystick in an upward direction, and there was a dedicated punch and kick button for controlling the character. You can perform high and low attacks as well as attacks in the air, plus there's also the life bars at the top of the screen. The game was inspired by the films of Bruce Lee, and it was a pretty big hit in the arcades. It garnered many ports on several home consoles. And while Konami continued to produce fighting games over the years, none of them had quite the level of importance and significance as this game did. Another important game from 1985 is Typhoon Gal from Taito. And this is important for a few reasons. The first being that it features a female protagonist. And the second is that it is based around judo martial arts. So there's lots of grappling and throws here. And what you do is go to these different dojos where you fight through it up to the head of the dojo. And after that, you travel to another dojo going to multiple locations before a certain amount and then it repeats again. The presentation here has many of the hallmarks of a beat-em-up and it does play similar to that. And I do still think it's a fighting game, technically. We'll see some other games that resemble this format. There's an interesting one from 1985 that you don't hear about much. It's Shanghai Kid from Tayo System. And this one's really interesting because it has a rather complex turn-based fighting system where you see a target either appear on your side or the enemy character's side. And then you have to react by pressing the correct button combination to either block it or attack. And there is some flexibility with the options here. You can, for example, throw your opponent and you can also do air-based attacks. It's overall a really fascinating fight system. And this one actually got a type of port for the NES called Flying Dragon, and it eventually turned into the Flying Warriors series from Culture Brain. And here we have Konami's fighting game from 1985. It's Galactic Warriors. This one's really interesting because it's the first time that you can select your player. You have three different options to choose from and each one has a different loadout option of weapons that they can use during the fight. You can see which one is selected at the bottom of the screen under your life bar. This game was also first to feature a block button so that you can block the enemy's attacks and it also has a pretty cool outer space sci-fi theme so you've got mechs fighting across the galaxy with aliens and other mechs Pretty clunky fighter, but it's still worth checking out if you're curious about these old fighting games. I can appreciate how creative they were getting with this, especially in stuff like these outer space levels where you've got floaty gravity. Before we move on to 1986, let's talk about Way of the Exploding Fist. 
Now this was a fighting game with a karate theme, just like Karate Champ, and it came out for the Commodore 64 and some other microcomputers, and it was pretty popular. It definitely seemed inspired by Karate Champ with the way that the match systems work. It's point-based where you get either a half or a whole point. So that means there was no life bar here. And it spawned a few sequels as well as other kind of similar games such as International Karate, which also did originally release in 1985. And it was also successful enough to have a sequel called IK Plus or International Karate Plus which employed an additional third player adding them into the rounds. So at this point we can see there is some standardization beginning to happen, most using that side view and some different types of thought with how to approach the controls. We'll start off 1986 with Gladiator, published by Taito and developed by Illumer. This is stretching the definition of a fighting game a bit. That's because there are parts of the game that are actually not fighting and it's more of avoiding obstacles. And you can see we've got some impressive multi-sprite characters here that are quite large and they're wearing armor which can be individually removed any time that you're struck within that spot. So you can defend it by moving your shield in the way and you can also attack enemies any point up, mid, or low. And if you strike them on the armor, it removes it. And therefore, if you can hit them any place that does not have armor, then that will count as damage. Another cool feature is you can pick up the dropped weapons of enemies sometimes after you defeat them. The portions where you're trying to defend or avoid the obstacles, you can also regain some of your armor and sometimes pick up weapons that are dropped during that time. Now I do recall seeing this at a couple different arcades in the 80s and it was quite impressive seeing these large characters. The way that they articulated the moves and animated the figures seemed pretty cool. Playing it today it's still actually a pretty fun game and quite challenging and a lot different from the fighting games that we're familiar with now. Moving on to 1987, we have the original Street Fighter, and this one had a few innovations that were pretty critical. One of the main ones was the way that the control system was set up for the original release, and it had huge oversized buttons that the player needed to punch, and depending on how hard they punch it would register it more. They were really going for that immersion. And the game also features special moves which can be executed by a series of input commands in succession. It's the first Hadouken and Hurricane Kick. There was also a standard version of the cabinet that had the buttons and there was six different attacks split between punches and kicks, which was a large variety for a game at the time. Overall, you can tell that there is quite a lot of similarity to something like Yi'ar Kung Fu and it's moving into a more advanced and complex direction. Let's go back to the Commodore 64 for another landmark fighting game from 1987, and this time it's Barbarian. Set in a Bronze Age Conan type of setting, this brutal weapons-based fighter featured a fair amount of depth and even has the first example of a fatality at the end of a fight. The game was also released on other platforms including the Amiga and the Atari ST. Moving into 1988, Let's check out a boxing game from this year. It's Konami's Final Round. And this one shows quite a bit of progress from the boxing games we saw earlier. Now we've got really large sprites with quite a bit of detail. We even have some switching perspectives between when you're fighting and then when you're trying to get up from the mat. And a lot of boxing games at the time did opt to use this kind of viewpoint, often similar to what we associate with belt scrollers or beat-em-ups now. Here's a game I remember seeing around a bit in the 80s. It's Kageki from Kaneko and published by Taito. The game shares a number of similarities with Renegade, which is a beat-em-up from the time, 
but this one I would say it's more like a boxing game from how it plays. So you're just a dude with bandaged up hands taking on big gangs one at a time. It resembles Typhoon Gal, how you're kind of going to these different locations and then working your way up to the ladder until you fight the boss. When the player's life bar goes down all the way, you can simply continue instead of going to a full game over screen and starting the round over. You just start immediately from where you lost your life. The game did receive a port to the Genesis, however, it does not seem to be remembered fondly. Here's an obscure one for you, The Last Apostle Puppet Show, and it's the first game to feature pre-rendered graphics. The game was developed by Home Data, and it has a very unique presentation due to this feature. The gameplay doesn't fare so well, it's another pretty clunky fighter, but you can see that the life bars at the top with the timer are now starting to become standardized. Before Fatal Fury, SNK had Street Smart, and this is another one that resembles the fighting style that we saw in Kageki. And that's in the way that it's another button masher. This one is from 1989, and it shows us more of that trend of fighting games that plays like a beat-em-up type of style. One of the things I really like about this game is that it introduced me to the old super tough guy grandpa trope. These older dudes can really beat your ass. Hippodrome from Data East is another fighting game that feels like in that Conan type of genre, weapons based fighter, with a fantasy setting. This is a pretty straightforward side view fighting game with pretty simple mechanics. The strategy is to stick right up next to the enemy and, you guessed it, button mash away. Where the game excels, however, is the interesting presentation and unique enemies that you fight. The game also includes digitized voice samples, adding to the depth of the characters. You might hear some funny sounds coming out of the arcade machine. Violence Fight from Taito features really large, impressive sprites and multiple characters that you can select from. This is another not fully 2D fighting game, so it takes place in a beat em up style format. And thematically, it has that kind of gritty underground street fighting feeling to it. One of the most noticeable differences is the use of comic book like text for the sound effects or onomatopoeia which appears prominently as you attack each other. And here we have what is probably the last big fighting game before Street Fighter 2, and that is of course Atari's Pit Fighter. The Fighter was the first fighting game to feature digitized character sprites based on images of actual people. It had a great visual impact and a visceral impact as well in the arcades, impressing players with the grittiness and presentation and it inspired other games such as the Mortal Kombat series to use a similar method. This is also perhaps the pinnacle of that button masher style game where it takes place in a beat-em-up format and really you're pretty much just mashing the attack when you're getting at the enemies. Some of the unique features of the game are the weapons that are littered in the stage and also you can push the enemy into the crowd and often they'll get attacked by the crowd. That's a rowdy audience. I really enjoy these kinds of details in fighting games like this. So that wraps up our list for today. What are your thoughts? Have you played any of these games? Any of them that you might check out after this video? Hey, thanks so much for sticking around till the end of the video. And hopefully I'll see you again soon. Take care.